Hey, welcome to Theo Live, episode 43, I believe. Uh, today has been a gong show. It is this stream, I'm telling you, Ecamm didn't want to work. It just didn't. I pressed the button, ready to go live. Nah, bro. And then I'm like, okay, let me, let me restart my computer. Maybe that'll fix it. No. This is me just ranting for a second about Ecamm. If you schedule something, you should be able to go live. But for some reason today, I had to reschedule once, which is actually a lot of work when you have to like put in all the tags again, copy paste over and over and over again. And then that didn't even work. So I just had to do like a fresh stream unscheduled and then put things in after. And then I go over. I've been working on this article last night. I was up till 2 a.m. Just working on this article, making sure like I knew what I was talking about, writing my notes, getting everything ready for you guys. And then my, I open it up today. It's all gone. All gone. Where'd it go? Apple, you're supposed to automatically save these things. What I'm trying to say is there is a conspiracy. People don't want me to talk about that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but today we are talking about the patriarchy and, uh, yeah, that guy, that guy over there. Some people, I'm sure, are not going to be happy. So, let me let me just say, selfishly, please like this video before we even get started today, because there are going to be so many people. As soon as I said that I, this is what I was going to be talking about, I started getting messages of like, "Are you sure you want to be talking about this? <laughs> like, do you do you know what is coming for you?" Um, which is fine. Like I, I always say, like I drink my tears to make me stronger. Like in here, it's just, it's just a bunch of fundy tears and I just drink it up, get stronger and I'm ready to go. <laughs> but that being said for the, you know, for the video to actually do well and hopefully reach people. Cause today I feel like we're actually talking about something that's really important. You know, I try to, I try to stick to stories that are important that matter and make a difference. I think. But also, I feel like today is one that actually is really important because it's one that's being fought over. And people don't even know that they're fighting over this. That's the thing. Patriarchy is really sneaky. And a lot of people don't even realize that what they've been a part of is actually patriarchy. And I know, I know, as soon as I say that, there are going to be people who are going to be commenting and be like, bro, you so woke. I can't even call you bro. You know, like stuff like that. I get that. You're welcome to do that. Uh, if you're mean, I will delete your comment. But, you know, we can have a difference of opinion. But this thing is sneaky. And I'm coming at it from a background of independent fundamentalism, which, you know, I don't promote day drinking, Genuine JC. I'm just saying that if you were doing a drinking game, because I don't know when you're watching this. Maybe you're in the stream. Maybe you're not, you know. If you're doing a drinking game of Theo Live, uh, yeah, uh, the whole IFB thing comes up quite a bit. So uh, I guess take another. Uh, maybe it's just a swig of coffee, okay, Baptist? Like, it's just a swig of coffee. That's what I got going on today. No tea. I actually have coffee because my wife made me coffee like a good housewife. Am I in trouble yet? It's it's going to be it's gonna be a lot today. Um, but... Uh, this thing is sneaky. It surprises you. Uh, I firmly believe that my background was very patriarchal and uh, I didn't realize it. I thought we were complementarians. Turns out we were not. <laughs> Turns out there was there was a lot more going on and people had different thoughts about complementarianism than I thought. So let me let me set the stage a little bit for today because today we're going to be talking mostly, hopefully, you know, I, all my notes went away, but we're going to look through uh, Kevin DeYoung's article on Desiring God. There's a link in the description of this video, or at least there should be, uh, to this article. You can find it pretty easily. Um, it is long. It is boring. It will take years off of your life. Uh, so I will try my best to summarize it for you. Uh, but we're going to be mostly looking at that, looking at some scripture too, and then lead, looking where this can go. And that's what's going to lead us to that guy back there, uh, which like I thought it'd be cool to have like a TV monitor with like, you know, like the thumbnail up 
Although it's not all the thumbnail. Because huh. I'm not in it. Because I thought that was weird of myself watching the back of me. Like, just like judging me. I don't want that. This past self judging me. Uh, but now I just, I'm just kind of scared. I shouldn't have done the laser eyes. Maybe. I don't know. It's appropriate, I think. <laughs> but uh, it's a little weird back there. But we're going to be talking about him later. All right. So we're going to break this up. We're going to talk about Kevin DeYoung's article. We're going to then transition to Doug Wilson. And as we do that, we're going to be talking about scripture and uh, dealing with some specific scripture verses that they just get wrong. And uh, so I will say at the at the very beginning, uh, I do not like Kevin DeYoung's uh, patriarchy blog post. I find it very prog- uh, problematic. Uh, there are lots of issues with it. And I think that he is promoting patriarchy. Um, and you'll see why as we go through the article. Uh, but, uh, before I guess we get into that, I always want to say hi to people who are here. Uh, Jeffrey was here right off the bat and I appreciate that because I was like trying to get the stream going and, and no one, it was, it was being all weird. And so Jeffrey let me know that it was, it was working. Uh, so he's on time. So that's sweet. Dark Smurf. I know you, bro. I'm here, Dean. Appreciate you being here, man. That's awesome. Uh, Dougie fresh catching the heat today says John Adams. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's catching the heat from me. That's not much. Heat. Like, let's be honest. The guy's gotten a lot more heat than Dean talking about him on his, on his, you know, little show. Uh, and R Mac, we are so glad you are here. I'm glad you are here. Uh, Vanessa is here and says, hello everyone. Well, hello Vanessa. I hope your day is going well. Uh, John says, Hey y'all, he's in Florida. Why are you saying y'all? I say y'all all all the time. That's very hypocritical. Uh, (laughs) Sarah, grab some tacos. Happy to catch the live. Great topic. Glad you chose to go there, Dean. Yeah, I did. Um, I've been waiting, you know, am I going to be doing this? Do I want this? Like, cause like I said, people reached out to me and were like, bro, you don't understand the Pandora's box that you are opening. Uh, all these people are going to come for you. And I was like, well, I already did it with MacArthur. <laughs> so <laughs> those people got pretty vicious. Um, uh, and John called me woke. That's all right. Um, Dark Smurf. In before is coffee as bad as drugs convo that my culture hung on to for a bit. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, too, am glad you are going there. Michael is here and says hello all. All right. So hop into the chat and let me know what you think as we go through this thing, because we're going to we're going to be talking about it. And uh, I don't know. Like, look at this thing. This, here, Let's go over here. Uh, this thing. This is a blog post. Like what? It's a, it's a little wordy and, um, I will say, you know, I've, in the past, let me, let me be clear on some things in the past. I've liked this guy. Okay. Um, like I, I, I have nothing against Kevin DeYoung. So for those who would be like, Oh, you just like to, you know, trash on people that you don't like. No, I like Kevin DeYoung. Uh, I've been very blessed by his works. I have most of his books just like sitting right over there. Um, so I'm, it's not like I'm coming at this biased against him. Uh, but he's the one who decided to write this post. No one asked him to (laughs) like the internet didn't come out and say, Kevin DeYoung, where do you stand on this? Uh, he's the one who decided, you know what? I'm going to pick violence today. He woke up and he chose violence and it was death to the patriarchy, complementarity and the scandal of father rule. So, um, like I said, most of my notes actually got deleted on this, but there are a few things that I really want us to focus on. So he starts off this, this article essentially being like, Hey, none of us know exactly what patriarchy means. Um, you know, it's like, it comes in with a lot of baggage and just because something has a lot of baggage doesn't make it necessarily wrong. Uh, to which I would agree, uh, to a certain point, (laughs) Like, of course, there there are words that that have baggage that are just, you know, society kind of uh, barriers that people have put on them. Uh, But it's not something that is actually real to the word itself. Like, 
just because of the experience people have had with a certain word, with a certain topic, doesn't necessarily mean that that topic means that. Uh, so an example of that would be, you know, for uh, some people, you know, the cross. Talking about the cross carries certain baggage for certain people. Maybe they came from a Roman Catholic background and it means something different to them. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their experience is valid for the word itself and what it means and, and what it entails, all of that kind of stuff. So I think we all understand that. Uh, but where Kevin DeYoung goes, uh, I think, wrong right off the bat is to say like that it doesn't matter. Like that's essentially what he does. He, he starts talking about patriarchy and saying, well, just because there are other people who have experienced different aspects of this, it doesn't mean that this word is wrong. Um, but then he just like ignores why there's so much baggage, at least in this article. Now, I'm not saying in his own life and in his own teachings of different aspects, but in this article, uh, he doesn't deal with any of the baggage that comes with this idea of patriarchy. Now, if you're going to come into an article and say that something that is highly controversial as patriarchy is, and say that this is a good thing, even though some people say it's a bad thing, like, and then you don't deal with the bad things. I don't think that you're starting off an article well in, in trying to help people understand this misunderstood term. And that's essentially what he's arguing for. He's arguing that patriarchy, this word, has been misunderstood and later on is good. Uh, so he, he starts talking about how if he were to say, and uh, let, me, let me bust this guy out here, making sure, yeah, okay, you guys can see it. Um, but if we're going to look at it as there's good male leadership and bad male leadership, that that's just too superficial is basically what Kevin DeYoung is arguing for. So the idea of complementarity means good male leadership and patriarchy means bad male leadership. Well, that's just kind of juvenile in Kevin DeYoung's opinion. Uh, to be sure that distinction isn't totally misguided. Okay, so he, like, this is what he does. He kind of wiggles out several times in this article. He, he says, like, things like, well, it's not... It's not that that's completely wrong, but he doesn't say how wrong that is. He doesn't give examples uh, of why certain aspects of it would be wrong. He just uses like a lot of these like almost and something like he, he uses that quite a bit of something like patriarchy is, is what he's going to even come to his conclusion about that it would be good. Um, but it's, it is a little predictable and a bit superficial if he were to do that. Uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong about being predictable. I like predictable. This is what the creeds are about. <laughs> like, we should have a predictable faith. <laughs> like, the Bible is pretty predictable. I don't, I don't think that we go wrong with that. So, uh, But he, he doesn't want to do that. He, wants, he doesn't want to be superficial, which I do agree with. You know, you don't want to go and just be like the most bland version of something, you know. Like I try to do that here on this channel, keep it a little bit lively for you guys. Um, but let's look at this paragraph here. Yet there is something in the broader idea of patriarchy, no matter, see, see again, this like the broader idea of patriarchy, like these very vague words, no matter how sinister the word itself has become, that is worth claiming. And this is going to be like the whole point of his article is that, you know, there is something in this idea of patriarchy that we need that is worth reclaiming. Uh, if the vision of male-female complementarity is to be more than a seemingly arbitrary, and this is, this is where we start to understand where he's going, okay? Uh, more than a seemingly arbitrary commitment to men leading in the home and being pastors in the church. So, this is what really Kevin DeYoung is trying to do here. Let me, let me move this around a little bit because we're going to be here for a bit. Um, he's really arguing about this right here and this right here. So this would be Realm 1. We'll talk about Realm 2. And really what he's talking about here is male headship. Now, if I say that and you immediately start being like, uh, I don't like where you're going... <laughs> Uh, male headship is biblical. Let me be clear. 
not all <laughs> male headship is biblical. All right, what you might have experienced might not have been biblical. But there is this idea of male headship. It's very clear. Paul in 1 Corinthians starts talking about it. But what does that actually mean? What, what is male headship? For some people, they just take it and they go, oh, okay, well, men are always in charge. And that's really what patriarchy is all about. And this is why Kevin DeYoung is writing this article. Because he's looking at people who would claim to be complementarians, or at least have complementarian theology, uh, which I guess I should kind of define a little bit. Uh, by that, I mean that men and women have complementary roles, different roles within the context of three different realms that we'll talk about here in a second, uh, that God has de uh, designed us differently, not just physiologically, you know, that we have different, you know, stuff going on. <laughs> But we also are different types of people, uh, that there are certain things about us, our nature, that makes us good for one another. Um, now, some people try to really flesh out what that actually is, like the, the actual differences. And it becomes very stereotypical uh, that, you know, so, stuff like, uh, well, women are more nurturing. They're just more nurturing by nature. Uh, which is not necessarily the case. Uh, or men are, uh, they're just better rulers. You know, there's something, there's something bolder about them. Not necessarily the case for every man alive. Uh, we are all different, but that's where people go wrong when they start talking about this complementarity between these two genders. They try to start to put in, okay, well, you know, let's just make a list of everything we know about men and women, put them in their categories, and that's what it means. Uh, and then they go into stereotypes, and all of a sudden you're talking about, you know, a Stepford wife basically as, you know, what it means to be a woman and that they're supposed to be in the kitchen. They're never supposed to leave the kitchen unless the husband gives them special permission to leave that kitchen. Uh, you know, stuff like that. It, it becomes very, I don't know. 1940s, I guess. <laughs> but uh, this is this is what he's arguing against because he looks at people, and really he would look at me in this, uh, and he would say there are people who view this idea of male headship, and they would say it's three different realms. So for him, he starts in the home, and then there's in the church, and then what he's going to be arguing for and what patriarchy is all about is the idea of it being not just in these two spheres, but also in the world. And what does that look like? This is the way I always write it out. Um, but that looks like the woman being subject to the husband. Oh, no, I don't want to use pencil. I like the idea of using this. So to the husband, the churches, to qualified pastors, and in the world, all men. Big difference between those. So these are the three different spheres that you could accept male headship. Now, in the home, uh, I, I have a video here on my channel about genders within the church. I, I don't want to go into all the details of those specific passages. So you could go back and you can watch that stream uh, where I deal with these things. But Ephesians 5 makes it very clear that there is some type of male headship within the home. Now, what does that look like? That's always the question, right? Like, uh, I will say, for those of you who, who would take it as uh, that the man is like the priest of the home because look what Jesus does for his church. That is an illustration that Paul gives to the Ephesians to help them understand the depth of the love that Jesus has for his church, not the specific actions that a husband is to take for his wife. That's ludicrous. You are not going to wash your, your wife's sins away. Like it's, it's a ridiculous idea to think, Okay, everything that Paul lists there as stuff that Jesus does for the church is supposed to be things that the husband does for the wife. No, and we see that actually just a little bit later. Uh, he, he basically just sums, uh, sums it up again, that in the same way, husbands are to love their wives. Like, that's the point. Husbands are to love their wives, 
not all the the different ways. It's just an example of like the kind of depth of love that a husband should have for his wife. So for those of you who are like, oh, well, the husband is like the, the priest of the home, not biblical, not biblical at all. Um, so that's not a good form of male headship in the home. But there is some idea of male headship in the home. Uh, you can go back and watch that video for more on that, or you can ask me any questions here in the chat while we're live. Uh, but then there's the second one, and that is the church. First Timothy 2 makes it pretty clear that women are not to be elders. Um, and then he gets into the creation order, so we know that that's not just something that is specific for that local church. At least that's my belief. Now, you might be here, and you might be egalitarian, and you might be like ready to throw your computer monitor. I don't know what you're watching on your phone. Don't throw your phone. It'll crack, uh, especially if it's an Apple one. Um, but uh, some of you might not be. That's okay. We can have conversations about that. Me, I am complementarian in my theology. I don't like the term. I don't accept the term anymore uh, because of people like this, <laughs> honestly. Uh, for people like this and what we're going to be talking about in a little bit, uh, they take it to an extreme. And I do not appreciate that. And so I do not want the label because there are complementarians out there who are saying that they're complementarians, like Kevin DeYoung, who are actually, well, we'll see. So we'll see what he says for himself later. Uh, but I do believe in male-only, qualified male-only eldership. Uh, and I base that off of 1 Timothy 2, amongst other passages. Uh, and for those who are might be here and being like, wait, what? You think women should actually be silent in the church? I don't think that's what it means. I think it's talking about the teaching act. The thing that a qualified elder is to do. I'm a 1689 Baptist, so I do believe that the, the idea of preaching is not for everyone. Uh, it is for qualified elders and those who have been approved by the elders, by other qualified elders to preach the word. So when they do that, they exercise spiritual authority. And that's why I take First Timothy chapter 2 uh, with women not exercising authority over a man. It's talking about that spiritual authority of opening up the word of God on the regular Sunday morning for worship uh, or whenever they meet. Um, so that would be the second realm. So here... You know, it's very clear that that's who he's talking about, those who would hold those. And he's saying that's just arbitrary. To which I would say in some ways, because the thing about um, this idea of complementarianism is just like it's almost like Calvinism. Uh, you should, and I guess anything, but only go as far as Scripture goes. That, that's what we should do in our theology. You know, for those who like to meditate and think lofty thoughts and they think that they're, you know, so intelligent to be able to uh, make so many conclusions off of, you know, one specific passage, uh, be very careful uh, that you do not go beyond Scripture. Uh, because there are complementarians that we'll look at here uh, that will go beyond Scripture, and all of a sudden they're not talking about, you know, this beautiful relationship between men and women uh, the way that God has created us, they're talking about something else, uh, and they're starting to abuse that. Uh, so for me, I'm okay with one and two, so these make sense to me. This is where it goes all wrong. Uh, there is nothing in the Bible, nothing about the, the idea of women being subject to all men. Those passages that people might run to, they are twisting like crazy. Uh, there, there is nothing there. Even if you're going to go to Paul and saying, "Oh, well, the uh, the wife is the image of man or the glory of man," and then you know, take it of like the 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 verse about how um, man was not made for woman, but woman for man. Go a couple verses down, okay? A couple verses down, and you'll see very clearly that they are independent, that they, they don't have to have one another. In other words, you know, if you have a man without a wife, it doesn't make him less of a man. And if you have a woman without a uh, husband, it doesn't make her less of a woman. That God has made them unique and special in their own. So they don't need each other. And this relationship between the two genders is not worldwide to where the woman has to be subject to the man. That's not, that's not biblical. So, th but that's what 
this is arguing for. That's what patriarchy is really all about. It's the, the idea that all men are to have all women subject to them. So not just in the home with my wife, that if there is a decision that has to be made and we are both at odds about it, that she is in some way supposed to submit to me. You know, And if I'm doing my job, if I'm loving her well, I'm not probably going to be in that situation because most of the time she's right about stuff. Okay. I'm just saying, I don't know a lot. I know theology. That's about it. Like, I don't know I don't, the rest of life, how to build things. I don't know how to invest. I don't know how, how to, how to understand Calvinism. Okay. I could, I could do that. You know, like I'm qualified for some things, um, but other things, not so much. And so like, but that if there was a decision that has had to be made, well, there we go. Submission there. Uh, in the church, submission to the male leadership that is qualified. But also, I'll just say, not to any more effect than other men who aren't qualified. Right? Like, she's just it's just a church member. <laughs> so a church member should be, you know, submitting, and how that looks might be different, but basically listening uh, to the teaching of the elders just like anyone else. So women, men who are not qualified, you know, they listen and submit in that way. But here, not so much. All right. So let's keep on going. So he starts talking about the term patriarchy is much harder to define. So he's, he talks about complementarianism and, you know, what that means. And then talking a little bit more here about patriarchy um, and it's much harder to define. Strictly speaking, patriarchy, uh, patriarchy is simply the Greek word meaning father rule, and there is nothing in its etymology to make the term an uh, epithet. That's not how you say it. Of abuse. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, a lot of words are like that. <laughs> Doesn't mean that they're not. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know how that's an argument for it. And then, of course, talking about the patriarchs, it's talking about the fathers, not the father rules. It's talking about the fathers. Uh, So I I don't understand these arguments, these types of arguments, and I've heard them quite a bit. And then he starts talking about, well, Wikipedia says, to which I go like, wait, what? (laughs) Like a lot of this article is very heady. Uh, It's it's very academic. It's not like a a, a real like breeze of a read, okay? Um, But for some reason... Uh, He's like, all right, now let me talk about Wikipedia. And I'm realizing I need to hurry up a little bit. Um, But uh, he starts talking about Wikipedia and how there's a whole bunch of just, you know, nasty things that are said about complementarianism. But, you know, that's just, you know, hearsay, basically. If that's patriarchy, the world can have it. It's not a term you'll find in Christian confessional statements from the past, to which I will say, yes. Thank you, Kevin. (laughs) Uh, All right. (laughs) It's not a term you'll find employed frequently or at all in the tradition of the church as it defends uh, biblical views of the family, the church, and society. Uh, So basically he's saying like, hey, you're not going to find this and stuff. And then he says, why not end the the article right there? Complementarianism is good. Patriarchy is bad. Case closed. Enough said. Right? To which I would say yes. (laughs) That would be a good place to stop. Uh, But he did not. Uh, he had a lot more to say, uh, getting a little bit more into the history of it, things that I'm not all that interested in. I'm more interested in the theology of it. Uh, so he says the rhetorical, uh, uh, the ret- rhetorical I don't know, uh, deck has been stacked to defend patriarchy as presently and popularly understood is to defend the indefensible. So he's basically saying, hey, the cards have been stacked against us. Uh, everything, everyone just talks about this word bad. Uh, so everyone just thinks it's bad. And why is that? I don't know. I want to use it. <laughs> like that's, that's honestly the kind of argument that I think is actually being employed here. Uh, and yet most complementarians do not realize that in rejecting patriarchy, they have, according to the, uh, contemporary rules of the game rejected the very reality that they thought they could reclaim by an appeal to complementarity to which i say cards shown kevin um you know it took a bit but your cards have been shown 
essentially, what that means is that any complementarian that rejects all of patriarchy is not a real complementarian, or at least not not a full complementarian. That there there is some kind of superficial complementarian, which I I find highly offensive. Now, again, I don't accept the term anymore because of those who use it and abuse it. Um, but you know, as far as those two first realms, and you know, not to the degree that some people would use it, um, but I do believe in male headship in those two first realms. But that third realm of the world, that big one, <laughs> is uh, really hard to miss. It's that is no, that is not biblical. Um, but he says, most importantly, and along the lines of the last point, we should be careful that in dismantling patriarchy, we don't end up kicking out the cultural ladder from underneath and then uh, underneath us and then hoping that people can reach the right conclusions by jumping to extraordinary heights, to which I would actually agree with. I would agree with him on that. It is like because there is such a thing in our culture where we're so like ready to like cancel ideas and just be done with them. Uh, and if you are like just even talking about like some people, even when, when you're watching this and you hear me say complementarianism and start to try to help you understand a little bit of my theology. So I use that term to like get you on the track of where I'm at, not necessarily the same as every other complementarian. Um, all right, let me, let me go in here. All right. Just have some people in the chat. All right, it's going to happen. Um, but there, there is this thing where people are just going to hear that and just tune out because they don't like that word. And I do think that that's important to like not do with, with things. We have to deal with ideas. We have to deal with what people are saying, their behavior. Uh, we can't just like, okay, well, they, they said this one word that I, I'm not sure exactly what it means, but I don't like it. And other people who say it usually are bad. So I'm just going to throw that out. And next thing you know, you know, now your word that you use to describe yourself is under attack. Like that's the way the world works. So I get that. I, I would agree with him on this point that we need to be careful about these things. But sometimes it's appropriate. <laughs> sometimes it's appropriate to look at it like a word and be like, no, bro, you, you really should not be using that one. That it, like, look at all the attachment that it has. No, you should not be using that one. But I would agree with him on that statement. One of my great concerns, which sadly seems to be becoming more and more true with each passing year, is that complementarianism for many Christians amounts to little more than a couple of narrow conclusions about wives submitting to husbands in the home and ordination in the church being reserved for men. To which I would say, that's me. <laughs> and I go where scripture goes. And I do not go beyond scripture. And I stick in the bounds of scripture. And that's where I believe it is. Uh, that those two conclusions. And I understand what he's trying to say because he's trying to say, well, that's arbitrary, like you said earlier. Um, but the thing about the Bible is that it's not arbitrary when God says, do this or don't do this. Uh, so, like, I think what's happening here is that Kevin DeYoung is being too philosophical and not being biblical. Uh, you know, I'm not saying like he's, you know, forgetting the Bible completely. Uh, but I think what he's doing is the same thing. You know, I talked about Calvinism uh, a couple weeks ago, and this is kind of my classic example where, where the Bible says, hey, this is what it is. Go with that. And then where it doesn't answer certain things, let the tension just be there and be okay with it. And I feel like what Kevin DeYoung is doing here is he's trying to answer some of those tensions. He's trying to answer, well, why? Does God say it this way? And like that's that's a problem for me when I'm when I'm going to First Timothy chapter two uh, because I don't I don't interpret the end of that passage being that uh, you know women who must give childbirth they'll be saved through childbirth and, and say like there's there's some weird stuff I'm not even getting get into it there's some weird stuff that some hyper complementarianism people will will throw out and it's just awful. Um, uh, about like the conclusions of that passage. But what I take out of that is that God says it because God said it's supposed to be this way. And I'm okay with that. I don't have to have every logical reason of why 
why I believe that women should not be elders that, that, and unqualified men should not be elders. Like I don't have to give every logical reason for that. And I think what Kevin DeYoung is doing here is he's trying to find those logical reasons. And I think that's where he's tripping over himself. Uh, he, he looks at it and says, Oh, well, that's just like a narrow, you know, conclusion that's arbitrary, uh, to just come up with those two. I don't think so. I think it's biblical. And I, I stop where the Bible stops. I'm not going to connect any of those dots when it comes to this issue, because I don't think that we have enough trajectory of those dots. You got to have, you know, if you're doing like a, a picture, you know, remember like the dots on a page and you got to connect the dots. We only got a couple dots, bro. Like, I'm not going to try to connect them. And it's like, you could come up with almost anything on those dots on that trajectory. And I think that's where patriarchy goes wrong. But this idea of people using the Bible to talk about biblical patriarchy, I, I reject the term, but also like we don't have enough of a trajectory to figure out where those dots correlate. Uh, there's, there's like three. <laughs> okay. We need more dots and we can't come up with new ones. And I feel like that's what's happening here. Uh, and I understand the frustration because like when people ask me, you know, again, with that first Timothy two passage of like, well, why did God set it up that way? I have to put up my hands and go, I don't know. I don't know why God set it up this way, but he did. That's my answer. Uh, you know, you can go around to do a bunch of research and go deep on things. And maybe you're, you know, a hyper intellectual and you can come up with some ideas, but at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to find scripture passages that say this specific reason why. It's just the way that God wants it. And I'm okay with saying that. Kevin DeYoung doesn't seem like he's okay with saying that. If that's all we have in our vision for men and women, it's not a vision we will hold on for too long. To which I say, why? Why? Actually, there are huge sects of, of Christianity that have done it the whole time. So I don't, I don't understand where he's coming at with this and just being like, well, if you don't go patriarchy, you're just going to give up on complementarianism altogether. Uh, it seems like a very frustrated uh, sentence to put in here. Of the like, he's looking out and saying like, "Oh, this is happening," and I see all these people giving up on complementarianism. Well, maybe your version of complementarianism, and maybe the idea, like the term itself, complementarianism, because of the way people are using it. But the those two aspects they're holding on to, and that's biblical. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, of oh, well, if you don't go into this third realm, you're just going to lose it. No, you don't have to like. Like, that's like, again, I'll just stick with Calvinism because it's in my mind now. But that's like saying, like, someone who is, like, I don't know, uh, a four-pointer. Maybe they don't believe in limited atonement, you know, but they, they believe in all the other tenets uh, of Calvinism, or at least Tulip. Um, that that they're going to give up on their Calvinism. They're, like, uh, they're going to give up their, their stances on those four other ones because they didn't do the five. That doesn't make sense. Like this, this is just a, a sentence of frustration as they're looking at the, uh, as he's looking at what's happening around him and people giving up the term because maybe, maybe it's not a great term. <laughs> All right. Uh, so he keeps on going. He's, he gets like, you can see this. I, I hate it when they do this. This is something I've heard so often from different pulpits and it always makes me mad. Um, when they talk about Adam and Eve and how Eve was formed to be the helper for Adam, uh, they always end up talking about, well, God could have done something else. God could have made a, you know, whatever to, to be Adam's companion. So there's something about women. I always hate when they go, God could have given Adam a golden retriever and a gaggle of little Adams to keep him company. It's very belittling. I think it's condescending to the other gender, but whatever. Um, and here he says, but the differences between men and women were God's idea from the beginning. To ignore, minimize, or repudiate these differences between men and women is to reject our cultural, our creational design and who God designed it for. All right, so basically what he's saying here is that like, all right, well, if you're going to not go this full route of patriarchy, which sounds crazy to me, 
that Kevin DeYoung is actually making this argument. But if you're not going to go that full way and go into that third realm of complementarianism uh, of men in the, uh, that the whole world, uh, that all women are subject to all men, um, if you're not going to go there, then you're ignoring the differences between men and women, which is ludicrous. It's just ludicrous. Like men and women have differences. All of us know that. All of us know that. But the key thing about this, and this is the thing that he doesn't do here because it would be far too long and he has a book about it. I haven't read the book, honestly. Not going to be reading the book based off of this article. Um, but the differences between men and women, what are they? Like we can admit that they're there, but what are those differences? Now, I'm not talking about the physiology. I'm talking about like emotionally, spiritually, like who we are as people, the Imago date, like what, what is different between men and women? You know, like all of us can say that there are differences, but he doesn't say what those differences are. He just says that if you don't go this third route, you're, you're saying that there are no differences. No, I, I can fully, uh, say and, uh, believe that men and women are different, but I'm not going to make a list uh, of what those differences are based on the, the couple women that I've ha run in with, you know, like that I know personally, you know, I'm not going to just base everything off of my mom, my mother-in-law, my wife, and, you know, like my, my close family and some friends like that's like what, like the people, like if you were to make a list of the other gender and how close you are to be able to say, this is who they are. Like how many people is that? If you're like a really like just over the top kind of personality and you, you're, you're an extrovert, like crazy. And you know, a lot of people, you're very charismatic, a hundred that you would be able to say, I know them well enough to be able to like, is that, there's a drop in the bucket. Like my, my point in saying that is how much experience do we have with the other gender to be able to say the, these are always like the differences between them. Like, and again, because we're stepping outside of scripture, scripture doesn't say this is what it is to be a man. This is what it is to be a woman. And these are the motions that are always attached to them. It does give us some parameters uh, like there. Yeah. Like Proverbs 31 exists. I understand that. But that's like this ideal woman, and I don't think that it means everything for the gender. Um, we don't, like, what, we get a couple of verses every once in a while about what it means to be a man. Quit ye like men. What does that even mean? Act like a man. Okay, what does that mean? Right? Like, we, we have to, like, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is all of that is subjective. Because we don't have black and white and red saying this is what it is. In other words, that it's in the Bible saying that this is specifically what it means to be a woman. This is specifically what it means to be a man. We don't have that. So we're talking about things that are subjective and saying look, there's differences. And what Kevin DeYoung is saying, well, if you don't go to this third realm that I want you to go to of uh, all women submitting to all men in the world, then you're saying that there's no differences. And that's ludicrous because so many complementarians who would fit into those first two categories would not go that far. Um, yeah, and then also would still say that there are differences. So he look look at like the words that he uses, like as he closes up this article. Uh, everyone can see that on average, men are taller and physically stronger than women. Most everyone agrees that men and women have occupied different roles in the home, in religion, uh, and in the world for most, if not all, human history. To which I would say, bro, why is that? <laughs> like patriarchy <laughs> virtually everyone uh would also agree that boys and girls don't play the same or develop in the same ways and nearly everyone would agree that men and women taken as a whole tend to form friendships differently talk to their peers differently and manifest different instincts related to children sex and career almost everyone sees these things do you see the the subjective nature that he's saying these things in because he knows it's subjective and I think it's disingenuous to say like, oh, well, you're giving up all differences when you yourself are saying that these differences are subjective. Most everyone, virtually, nearly, almost, taken as a whole. Like these are words that we put in sentences to be able to say, well, there's always exceptions. 
Well, if there's always exceptions, you're not talking about like a firm, you know, this is the way it is. And so we're talking about something that is subjective. So it's just, it's a lot of that. Um, let's, let's hop to the end here. Because I do want to get in at Kevin DeYoung here, or um, at, what's his name? Doug Wilson back there. Um, let's, let's look at this. Uh, women were made to be women, not a different kind of man. That's something that's always said. Um, which, I mean, like, obviously God had a purpose. Uh, the stubborn fact of nature almost never mentioned is that men cannot do the one thing most necessary and most miraculous in our existence. They will not nurture life in the womb. They will not give birth to the propagation of the species. They will not nurse an infant from their own flesh. Deep down, men are aware of these limitations of manhood, which is why they feel the urge to protect women and children, and why in every society, Goldberg writes, they look to women for gentleness, kindness, and love, for refuge from a world of pain and force, for safety from their own excesses. When a woman sacrifices all this to meet male uh, men on male terms, it is to, uh, to everyone's detriment, especially her own. Men and women are not the same, and if we want to acknowledge that in the home and in the church, we need to acknowledge it in all of life and in all of history. The biblical vision of complementarity cannot be true without something like patriarchy being true. This word, this phrase right here, is cowardly. Yeah, I'm going to use strong language because he wants to use strong language here. Um, just say it. <laughs> if you're going to say it, then just say it. Like you, you basically wrote a whole article about how patriarchy is the inevitable conclusion of complementarianism and how complementarians need to go this far. Then just say it, bro. Like true with that, without something like patriarchy also being true. Um, yeah. So basically Kevin DeYoung believes in patriarchy and says that we all should, uh, as complementarians, as good complementarians, we should not give up this third realm. He says in all of life and in all of history, uh, that that's where we should go with, with this idea. Um, and again, like you look, you scan through this, scan through this and tell me how much scripture is in here. Like, not a whole lot. Genesis 1, 27. Well, let's, let's actually go there. Let's go. Well, let's go to Genesis 2, which is really where it's zoomed in, the zoomed in story. Um, so, it says in verse 20, The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal, but for the man no helper was found corresponding to him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man and, and uh, into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for she was taken from man. That is why man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Let's go up a little bit. Uh, let's go and remember, for those who are like, all right, well, the woman's place, because that's essentially what Kevin DeYoung put in there with the childbirth aspect, is to, to say, nope, this, this is where we're at. Uh, we, need, we need to focus here on the childbirth thing. Uh, man has their mission, which we'll look at in a minute with what uh, Doug Wilson says. Man has his mission, and women are to be focused on the man. Well, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. So God is talking to both of them. The mission for man is not just man. It's mankind <laughs> that we are to fill the earth, uh, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it and rule over it. That's, that's humanity. That's not just man. That's women. To them, plural. I don't feel like Kevin DeYoung gets that. And I don't feel like 
others do. Uh, let's hop into the chat and see what you guys are talking about before we start going at Doug Wilson for a little bit. Uh, I do have some time restraints, so it probably won't be that long. Uh, John, uh, LOL, I feel like that's a distraction with good male leadership and bad male leadership. Keep it simple. Yeah. Uh, the Bible says that the man is the head. It doesn't say that they are to be the head. They don't need to be a mall cop dominating everything to feel like they are the head. Yeah, I think that that's, that's an important distinction. Uh, uh, I would say specifically within the home. Um, yeah, that happens a lot. It's like they need to feel that authority. Well, why do you need to? It's, uh, yeah, you, you, if you are the authority, it's fine. Like, just be the authority, not, you know, go around parading that authority. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Jordan brings up, you know, some dark points, but I think some good points. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Now let's take a look at a church that practices everything you are saying. Uh, Doug, w w Dilson. <laughs> Doug Wilson's cult has so many sexual and physical abuse cases for such a small congregation. It is insane. Um, yeah. So let's, let's look at how dark this can get because, all right, Kevin DeYoung is saying, the third realm that you need to like all women submit to all men all around the world. And again, I'll say it because I'm already getting, uh, dislikes on this because you know, people aren't going to like it. Uh, if you're here and you're watching, hit the like button, hit, do me a favor. Uh, just shield me a little bit from some of the dislikes that are going to be coming. But, uh, that's Kevin DeYoung. You might say, Oh, that's not too bad. That's, that's a little bad, but it's not too bad. Well, let's look at something that's actually like really, really bad and where I think this inevitably leads. All right. If you're going to go to this third realm, all right, this sounds like some kind of like fantasy thing. If you're going to go to this third realm, I think that you need to understand that this is the conclusion. If you're going to say that patriarchy is good, you're, this is where the conclusion is going to be. All right. Um, Let's see, right over here. Um, what would you say men who don't know how to be a man or don't know how to be a good man or don't know that it's good to be a man, what would you say they should do? Okay, so let me let me just set this up a little bit. All right, so this is Doug Wilson having like a round table with some people about their books, including the guy who wrote uh, so – something like it's good to be a man or something like that. Foster. Um, he's having a conversation with him. And this is what I'm saying about the whole thing being subjective about these differences between men and women and what that exactly means. Because again, we're not talking about scripture. Scripture doesn't say, here's a list. Here's a list of all the ways that men and women are different. Uh, so this is what they have to do in order to say, oh, well, they are different in these specific ways. And how do you change? Because basically that's his question. Uh, he's asking uh, the writer of um, It's Good to Be a Man. He's asking him, um, you know, what a man who doesn't know how to be a man, how do they, like, how should they learn? Well, it doesn't say scripture. I mean, step one, this is why guys are listening to Jordan Peterson or Jocko Willink or Joe Rogan to a lesser extent. Is that all of these guys preach, uh, take responsibility for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think the the where you break free is when you stop being a victim. And that's why the gospel is so powerful right. because you have to own that you're a sinner before God. You broke his law. You're not right with him right. and you have to repent. And so you start taking responsibility uh, for, for your life. And it doesn't mean bad things have happened to you, right? right. Like right, not everything's your fault. Yeah. Uh, but welcome, once you take- Welcome to earth, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> but now when you take responsibility for yourself and start, start somewhere. And so we give some examples of it, but I think of it like a bike chain. You know, where it like okay. falls off the bike and you put the one around the ones, the one little gear and then you put it on there and you start to turn the pedals and the chain pops on. Yeah. And what guys need to realize is that there's not going to be turn by turn GPS instructions for manhood. It's supposed to be caught from other men, fathers, uncles, mentors through life. 
And if you haven't had a lot of that, the only way to do it is to throw yourself into life, to, to pursue these things. And, and it's the, in the action of doing these that we develop virtue. Join a church, go where men are. Yep. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. Work hard, get a vocation, but develop skills. You know, I think one thing I picked up from Chris is, you know, I urge my sons to be a good, competent at a thousand things and experts at, you know, one or two things. Right. You know, so start to build this thing. But what Learn things? how to tie a tie. Learn how to change your oil. Right. Learn how to how to outline a book of the Bible. There's so many things, but start developing skills and pursuing those things with other men. And uh, and that's really where things take off. All right. So that's his, this is the guy who's, all right, it's good to be a man, should be an expert on what it means to be a man. And his advice for someone who doesn't know how to be a man, not scripture, go hang out with other men and, and learn from them and, you know, learn how to tie a tie. Well, what if you're in a group of men that don't wear ties? You know, this is super, it's super subjective, right? <laughs> like, all right, what if... You know, I'm sure in their world, you know, it's about like, I don't know, things like hunting and being outdoors and working on cars and a lot of those kind of like, you know, just stereotypical things. What if they go into a group where, all right, well, it's, it's about loving comic books. Like this is something that's been told to me. It is like a very childish thing to collect comic books. Well, why? No reason, really. Like people collect different kinds of books. Some of them have drawings in them. People collect pictures of photographs and things like that. Like, why is that not manly? Well, it's all subjective. I was reading an article. I won't say the church because, like, I'm friendly with the pastors there, but it's here in Canada. Bigger church, more influential church, uh, where they had a blog post about how this person, like this, this son was living in his mom's basement. Like he had to go down there and get something. And it was wall to wall toys, like of, uh, and still in their boxes. And like, basically he collected stuff. And this guy who wasn't an elder at his church, uh, or I think maybe he was a candidate, uh, just started writing this public post about how this one guy who collected those kinds of things was not a man. And we need more men. It's like, well, what if you're at a church where there's a bunch of guys like that, like, well, it's all subjective. This idea when you're starting to try to like pinhole or pigeonhole everyone into this is, this is what it is that you are to be a man this way, or you are to be a woman in this way, it becomes subjective. And if it could be that there, why can't it be that over there? What if being like example, uh, world war two, uh, to be a good woman, looked a lot different uh, during World War II than it did right before, right? Like, think about, like, all, like, the, you know, like, the pictures of, like, the muscles and stuff and working in, uh, you know, all these factories and things like that. You know, some of them, some of these kind of guys would probably be like, oh, feminism all over the place. Well, I don't know. Like, that looked like being a good woman at that time because it changed a little bit based on what was happening around them because it's subjective in that way. There is not, like, this hard line of what femininity is, what masculinity is. Exactly, we have parameters in the scripture, but again, we don't have enough of those corresponding points to be able to actually make a trajectory and say that this is what it is. But they want to do that. Anyway, I want to hit up Dark Smurf, my bud. It's so hard to put into words, but it's uh, a three-legged race. When the biblical record doesn't go far enough, they lean on what uh, might extract from passages in Ephesians, uh, so they support conclusions about the third realm from the first and second only until they are challenged, right? All the time, all the time. Uh, and then Proverbs is here saying, hey, I'm here, but, you know, I'm going to kind of stick this one out. I appreciate it. As long as you hit the like button, Proverbs. No, I'm just kidding. So uh, Paul says in Corinthians that uh, the man was not made for the woman, but the woman for the man. Right. This is where so, it leads. Um, Adam was made for dominion, for the garden and to turn the world into a garden. Right. Adam was created with a mission, and Eve was created to tend the gardener. So That's right. he was he was created to tend the garden. She's created to tend the gardener. To tend the garden. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. 
rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. Them, Doug, like you are taking a passage that here's, here's the thing. Like a lot of these people, they just forget their hermeneutics altogether because they're so like, all right, well, what does that mean? Well, let me dig deep into like this, this phrase that is a little obscure that we're not exactly sure what it means, even though there's clarifying words, literally two verses away there in the, in the text that he's talking about. Um, but how do we understand difficult passages? What is like the basic hermeneutic that we, as people who interpret the Bible literally, that, that we, we appreciate and, and uphold? Well, if something is difficult, go to a passage that's clear and interpret it from that passage. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. We basically all are on the same page about that, I would assume. So let's go to Genesis 1. He said it to them. It's not that man has this separate mission. It's that we have a mission to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And I think it is violation of Westminster uh, that you can't you can't say something like that and be in like in line with that. Jordan, it's because they are grifting off the vulnerable. Um, I would like to disagree with that. Not going to. All right, let's look at these things. All right, let me let me let me go go back a little bit uh, because I do I do know uh, that you know some people on my channel like might not appreciate some of the words that we're going to look at here in a second to really understand Doug Wilson's patriarchy um, because as I said, uh, Kevin DeYoung is arguing for patriarchy. It's slightly different, but I do believe that this is where it leads, and he has already kind of made some drawn conclusions between him and Moscow, uh, Moscow, Idaho, where Doug Wilson's church is and his school and all of them. Um, he's already talked about them positively. Uh, and you can find that on the gospel coalition stuff. Uh, so I think that he's being influenced by Doug Wilson, by Joe Rigney, by people like that, uh, who are not complementarians. Uh, they believe in patriarchy. Uh, look at their writings. It's why they hate empathy. No, it's it's such a feminine trait. You can't, you know, like stuff like that. They they make like these obscure uh, judgments off of words that even I don't think they fully understand. But um, yeah, so let's let's look here at some of these words. If these words of like if there are going to be some things that are offensive, okay. But I, I do believe that this is where the idea of patriarchy leads, is that you're going to view women, because of things like this, you're going to view women as less than. Now, you would never say that. You would never say that women are less than men. You're not going to say something as ridiculous uh, and sexist as that. But that doesn't mean that you don't think it. And that doesn't mean that you don't believe it. And we have to judge from your words and from your actions what's really happening. All right. This is how Doug Wilson talks about women. Minimize the seriousness of it so that you can walk away from a couple of big boobs without feeling like you have just fought a cosmic battle with principalities and powers in the heavenly places for crying out loud. Pastor. Teacher. Doug Wilson. Talking about women just in that way. Well, they're just a couple of big boobs. Like it, it's junior high, like level uh, of dialogue. And it's also just incredibly offensive to boil someone down to just that. Uh, and he does it constantly. Now, this is uh, some of the stuff that I got from, um, um, oh, what's Colleen's last name? Pack. Oh, I want to give her credit. I'll, I'll, I'll find it later. Sorry, Colleen. You might be watching here like, wait, what? You don't even know my last name? My bad. I'm live and I blank out sometimes. Um, but this is this is what he's talking about. This is the way that he's talking about women. I'm not going to read all of these because I don't want to spend all day just like looking at you guys and being like, what the heck? <laughs> but this is, this is the way that he talks as a pastor and he thinks it's appropriate. Uh, and like... I don't, I don't want to get into so, like someone's character and say like, why are you using those words? Because that's not what I do on this channel. 
But this is one of those moments where I'm really tempted to be like, all right, well, I think we can make some conclusions about you. Um, but this is, this is what they do. Like, this, like, I would like you to imagine, says, says a pastor, I want you to think of this, if you will, a tall woman with raven black hair, full sensuous mouth. I don't know what that means, but okay. A glint in the in her eyes, uh, an overtopped bustier, uh, a short skirt, and thigh high leather boots with heels. Says Pastor Doug Wilson. I want you to think about that. What are you trying to get your guys to do? Lust? Because that's what you just made them do, right? Like you wanted them to think. And just the, the again the description. Uh, but this is the guy who wrote a book about a sex robot. Yes, you heard me right. If you're not familiar with Doug Wilson, you might be like, wait, what? He, he wrote a book about a sex robot. It's called Ride Sally Ride. And uh, it's about as awful as you think it would be. <laughs> it's, it's filled with all kinds of trash. Uh, now, I do understand that he was trying to make a point about the culture, especially like the, the pornography culture. Um, but like the way you do it, I think speaks volumes, uh, about what's going on in your heart. And here's a picture. Uh, look at the note. This is the graphic Doug Wilson used in his article entitled evangelical, uh, guilt, uh, published April 2nd, 2018. So why is the spirit of the age standing on your necktie? The guy's a perv, all right? Uh, I don't throw around words like this all too often, uh, but it's true. And uh, I think it's high time that people stop paying attention to this guy. And this is is a rule that I have on on basically all of my stuff. Uh, On Twitter, I will not follow someone who follows Doug Wilson because I believe that you are giving him a platform, that you are enabling him. I don't care if you find, oh, well, I don't like everything. I just think some of the things he says are interesting. He's very winsome in his words. Uh, as it's, Winsome is bad when you're talking about Tim Keller, but when you're talking about Doug Wilson, it's the best thing ever. I uh, don't understand that. <laughs> but uh, I have a rule. If you, if you follow him, I'm not following you uh, because I think that you're helping him uh, because that's what he's done. Now, I'm old enough to remember, like some of you guys are just – becoming aware of Doug Wilson over the last couple of years. I grew up in Washington state. I grew up in the shadow of Mars Hill. And I remember that you, people think it's the other way around. It is not Mark Driscoll platformed Doug Wilson for a lot of us. I remember uh, seeing stuff from him way back in the day, coming over to Mars Hill, they were buds. And you're, you're going to tell me that this isn't any different than Driscoll. Like some of the stuff that he's saying, the words that he uses. This is the exact same thing happening again. And people are just okay with it. Kevin DeYoung seems okay with it. I hope he's not. I hope he comes out and says some things after he gets some of the feedback from that article. But probably not going to happen. Uh, He continues to call him names. There's so many stuff that I could throw in here about this stuff. Uh, but probably nothing worse than this. All right. Offensive. Like I said, offensive. Now, uh, let me, let me pause this. I'm sorry if like even seeing that with the star in there was offensive to you. Uh, but I want you to see just like how awful this is. Uh, and let's listen to how he defends himself of using a word like he just used to describe women. Pastor Doug has this. Uh, the, the reason people get so upset with me saying things like this right. is it sort of crashes through all their pretenses. They're, because people are solemnly nodding along. Yes. You know, um, so there, were, there, there was an article that the White Horse Inn, um, which is a reformed outlet, uh, you know. Yeah. So, um, they published an article by, I think, one or two ladies nodding along with Nadia Bowles Weber saying, yes, purity, uh, some of her critiques of purity culture have real validity, and, right. and we've got to learn from these critiques. And I think, don't you people? <laughs> Look, I was, against, <laughs> I was against the purity culture shtick. Right. 
back before it was cool. I, right. the, the, I, I, saw yeah. problem, I saw problems with it then. Right. But you people are Johnny come lately to, to this, and you don't know the game that's being run right. at you. You don't know how you're being played. And when someone stands up and refuses to be played, and, right. and this is the, that's my exclamation mark right. for how I'm refusing to be played. And it's my telegraph, my, my signal to them that I know the game you're playing. I know what you're doing. And I'm calling you on it. And I'm not upset at all with how, you, how indignant you're going to get. You, you can't talk that way. You can't behave that way. You can't and then act all offended like you're the church lady. Right. So why can Doug Wilson, Pastor Doug Wilson, call women the C word? Well, because, you know, other people in the church aren't going to step up to them and use that kind of language against them. And you're just like, it's almost like patting them on the head. Like, you just don't understand how to play the game. I understand how to play the game. What about scripture? Like, I am not one of those people that's like, oh, if you cuss, you know, you're not saved. Like... People would be surprised, <laughs> okay? Uh, but there is a big difference between, you know, stubbing your toe and saying something, using some kind of profanity, and then going toward people, especially people who don't believe in God, and using profanity against them, and that kind of profanity. We're not even talking about things that the world thinks is okay. We're, we're, we're talking about things that the world looks at and says, what? Like, you can't say that. Like that, that is super offensive to the world. And this is a pastor going and using that kind of language toward them. It's just awful. Um, but that's, that's what happens here. Um, yeah, but that's, that's where this kind of thing leads is to this degradation of women. I believe that that's what patriarchy, if you go down that third route, you will inevitably end up uh, of thinking that all men, uh, like all women are subject to all men. That's the third realm of complementarianism. Uh, that's what uh, Kevin DeYoung is arguing for. He's also arguing for the idea of patriarchy being okay. If you go down that route, I believe that you're going to inevitably end up where Doug Wilson is. Uh, maybe, hopefully not using the same kind of language with the same kind of attitude, but the same kind of thoughts about the 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 differences between men and women. And all of a sudden you can talk about them in very different ways than you would have. Uh, I think that we can only go as far as scripture allows us when it comes to this issue as in any other issue. Uh, scripture is very clear, I believe on this idea of male headship in the home and in the church, although that looks probably different than I think a lot of people think. Uh, but that third realm scripture doesn't say that. That's where logic and philosophy lead. And logic and philosophy will get you in trouble quite a bit if it's not bound by Scripture. And as a Baptist, I believe that Scripture is the final authority for all faith and practice. And I think Doug Wilson and Kevin DeYoung would certainly say that's true, but I think that they've tripped over themselves chasing after philosophy and have led them to this place where they're like, well, we don't want to just be arbitrary. We want our uh, stances to make sense. Well, not everything about God makes sense. That might be offensive to you. It doesn't make sense in our finite minds. God is infinite, and he has way better plans, way better ideas than us, so we trust him. It's called faith. Our faith is a faith. Not everything about it is going to make perfect sense in our finite minds. And that's, that's cool for these people when they start talking about like eternity and predestination and things like that, but apparently not cool with them when they start talking about societal norms. We can only go as far as scripture allows. What happened there? That was weird. Uh, let's see, Jordan. Uh, men can never trespass his own guard and meaning wives can never refuse sex, leading to marital rape, which they refuse to acknowledge as a reality despite having seen bruises on their own congregants. Yeah, let's let's get into that just for a minute before we head out because that's an important aspect of the story. I'm not going to show the stories. I thought about it, but I was like, ah, it seems a little weird. Uh, you can go and look it up uh, of all the different stories of Doug Wilson's church in particular. 
when it comes to marital rape. Uh, I remember seeing a story on Twitter just last week and I was in tears over it. And I, I'm not ashamed of saying that. Uh, just seeing that story and knowing that this happens um, is awful. Uh, it is like, and I, I would say these people would be like, oh, of course it's wrong. Of course it's wrong. It should never happen. But when they use this kind of language so often, this is the way it always works. Followers go further. Followers go further than their leader. And so if he's willing to talk like this and to have these kind of stances, you know that his followers are going to go further. And in that church, there's been all kinds of issues far beyond like the stats of a church that size. Why is that? Why do we hear all these horror stories? Why is there a Vice article about him and his church and all these people who have been abused? Why is that? Could it be? that the, the words that are used to degradate women uh, from, from the pulpit, from the stage, from conferences, from podcasts, from the plethora of videos here on YouTube, like, could it be something to do with that? I think so. And I think that if you go down this patriarchal route and you get as firm as Doug Wilson is on this issue, that you're inevitably going to have people in your church who will go further and then will act out what uh, the tidbits that they've heard, and maybe they've contorted them a little bit in their mind, but I think that's the responsibility of the pastor, the elder, the speaker, the, the video maker, to make sure that they put out clear parameters for what they mean, and not just leave it to interpretation, uh, and you know try to be as controversial as possible in order to gain a following, and I believe that's what Doug Wilson has done, and I am honestly... A little shocked to see Kevin DeYoung kind of follow in suit on that a little bit of where he's he's going. I do not like the trajectory that he is on and uh, the things that he has to say about uh, how all complementarians should be this way. Um, but, yes. Uh, Grandma Joe is here. Uh, says the blatant lack of respect and in the name of faith, so off course, no accountability. God sees all this nonsense. Mark and avoid. Thank you, Dean, for reviewing this for us. Blessings. I appreciate that. Uh, and once again, I'll say before I head out, uh, like this video, uh, not because you know, uh, it's, it's make make sure that it actually gets to people that maybe it would actually be helpful for uh, before all the haters get to it and burn it down. I'm sure they'll try. Anyways, uh, that's it for today. Uh, I'll be back probably on Wednesday with another video. Uh, if you want this, uh, this show as a podcast, go on to your favorite podcast catcher and you'll be able to find it there. Theo live, uh, got some stuff planned for the rest of the week. Uh, also have some family around, so we'll see if I'm able to do that, but just stay tuned. If you haven't, maybe, maybe you're here for the first time. Um, hit the subscribe button. I talk about this kind of stuff every Monday. Uh, every Monday I go live talking about theology, talking about church culture, got some stuff up my sleeve I'm working on. So, uh, just stay tuned, I guess. Uh, but I hope you have a great rest of your Monday, a good start to your week and I'll see you next time.